awesome. Well, I am actually going to preach a message on tacky Christmas sweater. Yeah. I've actually entitled this, Finding the Christ in a Tacky Christmas. And Christmas is a time of celebration of the birth of Jesus. We all have reiterated this this morning. But we understand that Jesus wasn't born on December the 25th. Nevertheless, it is the day that we have set aside to celebrate that day and to celebrate the significance of Jesus coming into the earth. And so we look at it and we can see that the world has taken this very important moment for Christianity and they have marketed it and they've commercialized it and they have created some pretty tacky things to go along with it. Kind of like this sweater, right? Kind of like... Well, I won't mention any names on the, in the place. But we look around and we can see a lot of tackiness as it relates to Christmas. Uh, think about Christmas songs. So I took a look at the country living top 60 Christmas songs. And so I want you to listen to some of these titles. Some of these may be your favorite songs. Last Christmas. It's actually Tegan's favorite Christmas song. <laughs> He plays it and he just sings it, but you know, think about it. It says, last Christmas I gave you my heart, but the very next day you gave it away. <laughs> just, just a wonderful Christmas feeling. Uh, I saw mommy kissing Santa Claus. Here's a good one. Merry Christmas, I don't want to fight tonight. <laughs> You're a mean one, Mr. Grinch. Y'all need to get into that a little bit more, right? You're a mean one. All right, that's better. I want a hippopotamus for Christmas. I mean, where did that even come from, right? <clears throat> and then there is Funky, Funky Christmas by New Kids on the Block. And then one of my personal favorites is Grandma Got Ran Over by a Reindeer. <clears throat> and the number one song on the country living top 60 list is All I Want for Christmas is... Not that one. All I want for Christmas is you. But I don't think they were talking about Jesus in that song. And then there's some interesting Christmas traditions like figgy pudding and fruit cake. And I even heard about one that was called hiding the Christmas pickle. You don't do that? You do that? All right. Everyone's going to Andy's house this Christmas. We're going to learn a new tradition. But all of these things that we have added to the Christmas experience have nothing to do with Jesus. But it's still my favorite time of the year. I love to hear the Christmas music. I love the, the magic of the season. How many of y'all love just to see the lights and the decor? Uh, we love to celebrate Christmas at our house. But what I looked into in the scriptures was realizing that there actually are some tacky things that are connected to the birth of Christ, even biblically. And I want to talk about five of those tacky experiences. Just to remind you, the notes are in your church app. Uh, for those of you that have not downloaded that yet, it's iconchurchapp.com. You can follow along with the message notes. First of all, we have to reflect on the significance of God sending His only Son to the earth. Think about that just for a moment. He was royalty. He was literally present at the creation of all creation. He was the Son of God. His name is above every name. And so you could expect that when God decided to send Jesus into the earth, that People would come and it, there would be great fanfare, there would be great honor. He would be ushered in with pomp and circumstance. And, and so I, I wonder what we think about whenever we imagine that moment when God released and he birthed Jesus into the earth. I mean, everyone should have known that God had shown up. Everyone should have realized that the Son of God had entered the earth. But we know that's not exactly the way it happened. The very first tacky thing that we find is that no one was prepared for him. No one had room for him. In Luke chapter 2 verse 4, if you want to turn there with me, I'm going to go through a few verses this morning. I'm not going to take you longer than three hours today. It's going to be 
a, a short message. Luke chapter 2, verse 4 through 7. Joseph also went up from Galilee and from the town of Nazareth to Judea, the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. I just read this to the kids. Because of the house and lineage of David. Remember, that's King David. To be registered with Mary, his betrothed, or in our understanding, engaged, and who was with child. While they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. This is his beginning. Literally, there was no room for Christ to come. There was no place for him. There was nothing and no one that had set aside and made room for the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the name above all names, the one who was at the beginning of all things. Now there is no place for him to reenter the earth. There's no place for him in the end. It's interesting, the word in there makes me think about kind of a little hotel or a motel. That word could also mean guest room. So there is the indication that it isn't even as unpersonal as a motel room that doesn't even know Jesus, who has no room for him. It could even be implied that even their own family members didn't have room in a guest room. So humanity had created no space for a Savior to come. Mary and Joseph and this soon-to-be baby were disregarded and not given priority. Jesus was born into a family with no significance. They weren't popular. They weren't rich. They had no political influence. God had chosen a nobody family and a nobody place to begin his divine royal family. And so then we have to think about not only did they not have room for him, but the king of Israel actually wanted to make sure that no one would ever make room for him. That's our second thing that was tacky as it relates to the birth of Christ. And that is King Herod was used by the enemy to try to stop the very plan of God. Go with me to Matthew chapter 2. Are you still with me? Matthew chapter 2 verse 1. 1 through 8, we see the story here, and it says, Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea in the days of Herod the king. Behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. And so they were saying, where has he been born, the kings of, of the Jews? Because the wise men had been watching, and they had been waiting for the Messiah to enter into the earth, and they recognized that that moment had come, and so they're trying to find him. And then the word got to the king that another king had been born. Now, realize that's significant, because there can only be one king. And so King Herod, it says, it, he was troubled, verse 3, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them, where was this Christ to be born? In Bethlehem of Judea, for as it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers. And from there you shall come forth a ruler. Go down to verse 16. I'm sorry, verse 8. He sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word. Now notice what he does. That I may too go and worship him. Verse 16, then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem, in all the region that were two years old and under, according to the time that he had discovered by all the chief priests and the scribes and the wise men. Now think about this just for a moment, that the tackiness of a political leader coming in and not only just trying to disrupt or to try to distract, but literally he now is trying to destroy any opportunity of another king taking over his place. So King Herod is coming in and he is literally being used by hell itself to take away the purpose of God in the earth. Those kinds of things still happen. We see that in the beginning there's no place for Christ because of that seemingly no significance. And yet on the flip side of it, King 
Herod says, there's such significance with this child that I'm going to take it out. See, I don't know where you stand today. I don't know if you feel insignificant. I don't know if you feel like that everyone's passed you by or if you feel like there's something on your life and all of hell is trying to keep you from being who you're created to be. I don't know where you're at. But then there's a third thing that we see. Jesus was born to an unwed teenager. So Jesus was literally brought into this world in a culturally unacceptable way. He didn't come in as the king. He didn't come in as the one that everyone was going to accept. But he literally, God literally chose his entry point as a way to identify with everyone who has ever been ostracized, everyone who has ever been looked over, everyone that has been pushed away because of something that is on your life, some stigma, some stereotype, something that people have categorized you as being not worthy of attention. And so Jesus comes in and literally is born by an unwed teenage girl. Now Joseph, most likely a a, adult mature man in that culture probably wasn't a 16 year old and a 15 year old Uh, we know that in our world that wouldn't work today but in that culture it was the way things worked and so joseph understanding that his betrothed wife was pregnant he could have caused problems for her as a matter of fact if he would have accused her of adultery then they would have stoned her. He had that power. But the scripture says that Joseph was not that kind of man, and so he wanted to put her away quietly. He at least was a man of honor. And so Joseph, I can imagine, as he's talking with his buddies in the first century locker room, they were pressuring him, why don't you get rid of the girl? She's going to ruin your life. This is going to be on you the rest of your days. It's going to look bad for you. It's going, to, it's going to impact your future. You know what we do whenever we're trying to help people out? When we're trying to convince them that there's a way for them to go the easy route. But the only thing is, is that Joseph had been visited by an angel, and he had been convinced of the word of the Lord. And so I can imagine now as this young couple enters into Bethlehem that they no doubt were ridiculed, they were judged because of the cultural reality that was on their life. You see, these cultural stigmas happen to us even today, don't they? Maybe women in a workplace, interracial marriages, young entrepreneurs, minorities, and on and on I could go. But somehow, even the religious people have chosen to reject them and push them out as if they don't have a place. But I think that's perhaps why God chose to put Jesus into a situation where nobody would accept him because of what he looked like. And so he could adopt and he could bring you into his family and say, no matter what's on your past, no matter what they say about you, no matter who pushes you out, you are a significant place in my life. You are my child and I want to bring you into your purpose and your destiny. You see, I believe that God has sent me here today because there's people out there that you feel rejected. You feel rejected even by the church. But God sent me here to say that He has not rejected you. He has not pushed you away. He is calling you close as He brought His Son into this world. If we look even closer at the life of Jesus, we could see some other troubling things. Maybe we would call tacky. Part of His family was was deceivers. Remember Jacob? What about Judah who participated in selling his brother to slave traders? Or Rahab, the prostitute? Or David, the adulterer and the murderer? And maybe even Solomon who had a bunch of wives. I don't know. But whenever you look at Jesus and all that he brought as it relates to a worldly standard, there wasn't much there except what was there. So as a matter of fact, Jesus would have been disqualified from rising to become anything significant. So what disqualifies you this morning? What has said to you that you will never make it? That you don't have what it takes? 
that you don't have the lineage, that you don't have the family name, that you don't have the gifting, you don't have, you've done something you shouldn't have done. Maybe your daddy did something that's over your head. I don't know what it is. But Jesus and the message of Jesus Christ is saying to you that you are not disqualified. There's number four. Lastly, Israel didn't even believe in this miracle. Israel was supposed to be the people looking for the Messiah. And they looked right past him. Mark chapter 6 verse 3 it says, Is this not the carpenter's son? The son of Mary and a brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon and are not his sisters here with us. And notice that it says this. It says they took offense of him. So not only did they disbelieve him, but they literally took offense at him. He wasn't wealthy. Israel was looking for a king of their making. And they were unwilling to submit to another way. See, I also believe there's some people here that you're looking for God to show up in your life your way. You're looking for God to do it the way that you have prepared for Him to do it. That you have got it all figured out that whenever this happens, then I'm going to follow Jesus. That whenever God does this for me or whenever God shows up in this way, and if God will do this for me, then I will obey Him. But see, this is the problem. The entire people of Israel looked past Him. The entire, entire nation of Israel said, I don't see him. Well, I believe that there's perhaps people in this room today, perhaps people watching online, that this is your moment to quit looking past the God that is looking at you, to quit forgetting about what he has already done and just begin to accept him into your life because he has a purpose and a call on your life and he is not going to move past you. And then there's the last thing. All of these other tacky things really are because of one primary thing. And that is what we call sin. Romans chapter 3 verse 23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now the word sin there is, of course, a naughty word. You're not supposed to use it, right? And we're really not supposed to judge anybody. But the reality is, is all of us are infected by it, or have been. The word sin there literally means to miss the mark. It just means that you're off course on what you were called to be, who you were created to be. It doesn't mean that you didn't memorize scriptures. It doesn't mean that you don't attend church. Those are just symptoms of something deeper. And it's this sin in us that causes us to miss the true meaning of Christmas, that causes us to miss the true opportunity that God wants to work in our lives. And there's a scripture in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, and it says this, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. You see, the only way... To not be infected by sin is to not sin. Now, how many of y'all have never sinned? At least we have some honest people. Right? I mean, all of us have sinned if we were truly honest with ourselves. If we were to look at the Ten Commandments, which they've taken down. If we would just investigate even cultural norms in the sense of what's right and what's wrong, all of us could probably be indicted even this week. I know I'm pushing a little bit close to home right now, but the reality of it is, is that sin is what separates us from God. And it's not an action, it's not a behavior, it's literally an aspect of our heart that separates us from a relationship with Him. You see, God did not send Jesus to make good people. I don't think you got that. God did not send Jesus into this world in the way that he sent him in order to make good churches. We're not here just to have good praise services so that we can honor Jesus coming into the earth. Jesus came into the world so he could change everything about your life. So that he could rewrite your history. So he could awaken in you what had died. 
You see, some of you are dead inside. Yeah, you look good in your tacky Christmas sweaters. Yeah, you look pretty this morning. But if we were being honest with each other, you would tell me, Pastor, I'm dead inside. But there is a Jesus that came back to this earth 2,000 years ago. And he has come to awaken you to your purpose and to make you come alive again, afresh and anew. You see, Jesus came to save us. He came to save us from sin. You say, well, that sounds so bad, Pastor. It's only bad if you don't let him save you. Jesus came to save the world from sin because sin keeps us from becoming who we're created to be. On the flip side of tacky, there's actually another way of looking at it. We're stuck with him. There's nothing that can stop him. There's no power on earth or in hell that will ever defeat him. The gates of hell can't even prevail against his church. You see, it's kind of tacky in the sense of we're stuck to him. He's not going away. He's not going to leave because of political persuasions or because of world problems or because of this or because of that. He will accomplish his plan and ultimately Jesus is coming again soon. We're stuck with him. Isaiah chapter 9, and then I'm finished. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace, it says this, there will be no end. It doesn't matter how many satanic churches are started. It doesn't matter how many atheistic efforts are made. It doesn't matter how many political pushes are released into our society. Jesus Christ has no rival. There is no one that is ever going to stand against him. He will accomplish his purpose. He will come back soon. And I want you to be ready to meet him this day. Jesus is the Lord Most High. Somebody shout Jesus. Stand with me this morning. You can defeat proof your life today. Because whenever you accept Jesus, you are welcomed into his family, into his church. I have a simple plea today. And that is that if you want to get out of the brokenness of your life, if you want to awaken to the life that you are created for, if you want Jesus to save you from sin, I wanted to ask you just to raise your hand right where you are. You would say, I want this day to be different. Just raise your hand with me. Yes, yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Go ahead, leave them up for me. Because everybody else in this building, we've, been, we've already been there. Tell you what, let me do it this way. If you have accepted Jesus and asked him to save you from your sins, raise your hand. Look at that. Look at that. That's all of us. None of us deserve it. None of us brought anything to God. But he looked down to all of us. So here's what I want to ask you to do. They're going to prepare a slide here in just a moment. But before we do that, we're going to pray. Because the scripture says that if you'll confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you will be saved. You don't have to pay any money. You don't have to memorize any scriptures. You don't have to do anything for any church. If you'll confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you will be saved. Here's what I want all of us to do with strength and with faith and with courage. Would you say this with those that have raised their hands today? And let's declare it together. Father God, thank you for sending Jesus to this earth. Thank you for sending Jesus to save me from sin. I give my life totally to you. I believe that you were born, that you died on a cross, but you rose again, that I would never die, 
but have life forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you give the Lord a hand clap of praise? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Here's what I'm going to ask. If our elders could just move to the front at this point. There is a slide on the screen. If those of you that have raised your hand, even if you didn't raise that hand, but you prayed the prayer, and you want us to help you in your journey, there's two ways you can do it. You can text the word SAVED to the number on your screen. Everybody's sitting down. I'm, I'm actually finished. <laughs> Go ahead and stand back up with me. I'm, I'm actually, I'm really finished. <laughs> Y'all like, he's, going, he's getting ready to preach again. I'm not. <laughs> Here's what I want to invite you to do. I don't want you to leave by yourself today. These people are trained and they love Jesus and they want to pray with you. So if you prayed that prayer prayer today, I want to invite you to come on your before you leave, just come up and let somebody pray with you and then you can be dis, dismissed. We're not going to embarrass you, not going to do no funny business. We just want to be there for you. But if you'll text the word save to the number on your screen, we'll connect with you and we'll serve you also as well. Amen. I believe we have I have one more thing to do. I have a video, all right? So I'm going to do this video, and then we're going to do our icon decoration. After our icon decoration, those of you that prayed that prayer, please come down and have a conversation with somebody. All right, guys. Thank you so much for coming this morning. If you could, just give a hand clap for our pastor for allowing God to use him this morning in his message. Also, I want you guys to make some noise for those people who gave their life to Christ today. Come on, make some noise for them today. Awesome. So we're going to go ahead and do our iconic declaration. I want you guys to remember that we're not going to have service on Wednesday. Why? Because it's Christmas. Right. And also, next week, we're going to have our New Year's service on the 31st. So be here at 8 o'clock. We're going to have games and fun and karaoke. So make sure you're here on time so you can be a part of all that fun. All right. So let's do our iconic declaration. It's in my DNA to be iconic. I will imitate Christ, care for others, overcome every obstacle, and never give up. We are Icon Church. You guys have an amazing Sunday afternoon and a Merry Christmas.